Living Lord, we thank you that you are a God that speaks. Out of your mighty grace and kindness, you desire to mold and form us into your likeness. God, I pray that today that your word would not land on hard hearts. I pray that it would not be met with deaf ears or blind eyes. But instead, God, may we receive your word. May you do surgery on our hearts. May we be formed into your likeness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. I confess to you that at times being a pastor and a mom in a church has its challenges. Uh, raising pastor get kids, as I'm sure you very well remember Pastor Greg, raising pastor's kids sometimes has a little bit of an added pressure. Uh, when my kids misbehave or do something crazy, especially in the confines of the church building, I think to myself, oh no, <laughs> people are going to know that it is my children that are acting out in this way. Uh, for example, my boys worship in the worship center. Not too long ago, in the middle of my sermon, I saw a paper airplane make its way down an aisle. <laughs> of course, that was one of my children. And I thought, oh no, what are we going to do? Uh, there was a time when my son was really young, probably four years old, and we were sitting in worship together as a family. And we were passing the offering plates by, and as soon as the offering plate made its way past, past Caleb, he took his hand and he grabbed just a wad of cash and checks right outside of the offering plate. And my cat-like reflex moved so quickly as I was trying to pry his hands from the money that he was holding onto so tightly and I was praying that nobody would notice the scene that was unfolding right in front of me. And I said, Caleb, no, this is a tithe. And he said, yes, it's a tithe and I'm taking my portion. <laughs> In all seriousness, I do think the concept of tithing can be a confusing thing for many people who call themselves Christians or who are part of a church. And even talking about money in churches is tricky. Um, I confess to you that I am fearful at times when the topic of money comes up in churches. It seems to be a taboo subject and many people shy away. They don't wanna lean in. They don't wanna talk about money when it comes to church. And yet, I also find it interesting because our culture is completely and totally engrossed with money. We're obsessed. Uh, we obsess over what an athlete's contract is. Uh, we obsess over box office revenues. Uh, we're very interested in learning what other people's salaries are. There's a whole website called Glassdoor. Uh, we we want to know who the Forbes list of wealthiest people in the world are. Uh, we're interested in inflation and, and stock market woes and how much people are making. Money is talked about everywhere, and yet somehow we don't want to talk about it in the confines of the church. Never ask, never tell, that's personal. And so we get really squeamish and there's resistance and us pastors know about this resistance very well. We experience it. And so we preach these sermons sometimes with incredible fear and trembling. We also preach these sermons out of a deep conviction, even knowing that there is risk. There's a number of risks that we deal with uh, when we're entering into generosity initiatives like the Forward Initiative. Uh, we risk people telling us that we are manipulating them, uh, that we're simply tugging at their heartstrings uh, to get access to their purse strings. Um, we, we risk people criticizing the church. Uh, someone saying something like, uh, you've got such nice buildings already, why do you, why do you need more money anyway? or we risk people rejecting or walking away from the church. Uh, it's not uncommon for someone to check out during a generosity initiative because they don't want to be around for it and so they might go somewhere else. They don't want their arm to be twisted. They don't want to be pushed. We know there is resistance. We know that there's a risk. We know that there is a cost. But 
it is worth for us upsetting the apple cart. We read just moments ago this seemingly harsh passage of scripture uh, that Rick just read to us from Malachi chapter 3. Uh, where God is seemingly angry at the Israelites. Malachi is a prophet uh, who prophesied in Israel uh, somewhere around 400 BC and is one of the last uh, prophets in the Old Testament. And he's prophesying and he begins like this in verse six. He says, I the Lord do not change. So you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept to them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. So right away on the outset here, we hear that God is calling the people to return to living in God's way and God's world. And it says, but you ask, how are we to return Will a mere mortal rob God, yet you rob me? But you ask, how are we robbing you? In tithes and offerings, you are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into my storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, and yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty." This was worth reading again, because I wanted all of us to hear and feel the poignancy of this test, text. We can hear the passion through the prophet that God is calling the Israelites thieves and robbers. We can hear him reprimanding them. He seems to have an edge, and this whole passage is specifically concerned with tithe. So let's talk about tithe for a moment and specifically what it meant in the Old Testament. Tithe, of course, means tenth, that they were to bring a tenth of agriculture and produce to give it to God. And so the the temple would have, or the places of worship, they would have a storehouse where they would bring the produce uh, for the, the temple there. In fact, in Numbers chapter 18, verses 25 through 29 says this. The Lord said to Moses, speak to the Levites and say to them, When you receive from the Israelites the tithe I give you as your inheritance, you must present a tenth of that tithe as a Lord's offering. Your offering will be reckoned to you as a grain from the threshing floor, juice from the wine press. In this way, you will also present an offering to the Lord from all the tithes you receive from the Israelites. And the tithes you must give the Lord's portion to Aaron the priest. You must present as a Lord's portion the best and the holiest part of everything given to you. And so as I mentioned, uh, in the Old Testament, the Israelites had something called a storehouse that was kept in the temple uh, where they would have tithes and food for the priests. It was part of God's provision for the ministry. It was part of God's provision for those who were in ministry. And what's interesting uh, to note here is 10% was simply a starting point for the people of God. Because when we look throughout the Old Testament, we see other kinds of tithes. Uh, For example, in, in Deuteronomy chapter 12, we see something called a festival tithe, which was used for religious celebration and worship. Uh, This was on top of what we just read moments ago about bringing produce to the storehouse. In Deuteronomy chapter 14, we see another kind of tithe that was used to care for the poor and the more marginalized. Uh, In every three years, they were to bring all of their tithes uh, to that year's produce and make it available for the widow, for the orphan, the fatherless, and the poor. And so actually, when we add all of this up, it comes to a shocking 23%. 
And then it, it just keeps going. Uh, when, we, when we get to Leviticus chapter 19, for example, we see that the Israelites were to bring their first fruits as an act of worship now to God. And so we see the purpose of tithing in the Old Testament uh, to be layered, if you will. And number one, it was to support the celebrations of the people of God. Uh, number two, it was to foster religious life and spiritual instruction in the community of faith. Uh, so that way the ministries of the people of God could continue on, so people could grow and be formed. And number three, it was to help care for the vulnerable, the widows, the orphans, and the poor. Looking at these three I couldn't help but notice how these so wonderfully and beautifully aligned with our engagement pathway. Invite, walk, impact. Invite, walk, impact. We want to invite people into the celebratory life of worship. We want to walk people into a deeper life of discipleship. And we recognize that we don't exist for ourselves, but we want to make an eternal impact in this world. Now, when we get to the New Testament, uh, we don't see any sort of instruction on a percentage uh, that the people of God were to tithe. We don't see anything about 10% or how much they were to bring. It doesn't even say that we ought to give 5%. It doesn't even say that we ought to give 1%. It's true, tithing is an Old Testament concept. So what does that mean? We can all go home and, and we aren't to tithe and say, well, good, praise the Lord. God has done away with tithing and there is no responsibility for us. Actually, quite the opposite. What we see in the New Testament is that the people of God in Christ, the early church, they were generous beyond measure. They were recklessly generous at times. They were wildly generous at times. In Acts chapter 2, at the birth of the early church, they couldn't give their resources away fast enough. In Acts chapter 4, we see the early church bringing the goods and laying them at the apostles' feet. They were pooling their resources together for eternal impact. They recognized that they were part of something so much bigger than themselves. And we see this reckless kind of generosity where they were in a hurry to give their resources away. In 1 Corinthians, we see Paul instructing the church to set aside money to support the resources and the ministry of the church, and he urges them to excel in the grace of giving. In many of Paul's letters, uh, we see him writing to the early church, uh, giving thanks for their financial support and sponsorship. In other words, generosity and stewardship does not disappear and the new covenant. But what we see is that the Old Testament law comes to fullness in Jesus. So, does that mean it doesn't matter how much? Some of you might be wondering, well, what then is the percentage point? We might say that 10% is a starting point. But I think we need to ask a different question. Rather than what percentage or how much, I think we need to ask the question of, if all that I have is gift, and if every good and perfect gift is from above, maybe we should ask, how can I steward all that I have been given for kingdom impact? Rather than how much, Maybe we should recognize that everything that we have been given at our fingertips is a gift from above. The clothes and the clothes, the resources, the talents, the treasures that we have at our fingertips, that is all a gift from God. And how can we use and pool together our very good gifts for kingdom impact? Rather than how much? Maybe it's, how can I use all that I have for kingdom impact? In Malachi chapter three, three, 
we see that God is utterly shocked and stunned that the people of God have held back. And perhaps it's because we need to view it through this biblical principle that all that we have is gift. So how could they not? How could they not respond back with the very good gifts that God has given them and equal generosity? You can almost hear God saying, you have all but gift and you withheld your offerings. You have robbed me. I sometimes wonder what God would say to the American church today. I think we have to honestly reflect. And I do think that when it comes to money, this is the hardest kind of reflection. I think we are the most stubborn in this area. Perhaps it's because we are afraid. But are we stewarding all that God has entrusted to us for kingdom impact. I want to invite you to sit with that question for a moment and let the Holy Spirit speak. Are we stewarding all that God has entrusted to us for kingdom impact? Perhaps this is bold, but 10% was a starting point for those in the Old Testament. What is our starting point? What is your starting point? And again, I ask, what is it that God would be saying to us today? Perhaps it comes down to the issue of trust. In our 20s, when Jeff and I went on the giving journey, I confess to you that it was Jeff that led the way. As a very young 23, 24-year-old pastor, I was terrified. We were scraping the barrel in our 20s, barely getting by, barely keeping our head above water. And every week, this was before online giving, Every week when I would watch my husband pull out that check and drop it into the offering plate, it was a moment of trust for me. It was a moment of trust for me, believing that that offering to God would be used for kingdom impact and that I would still be able to feed my family, that I would still be able to have resources We read moments ago from Matthew chapter 6, our gospel reading, where Jesus gets at the heart of worry. He says, don't worry about your clothes. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about what you are going to eat or drink. And I confess to you that I worry about these things sometimes an embarrassing amount. But maybe we just have to remember that everything that we have is gift. Jeff and I have prayed and prayed and prayed on how we will steward our resources for this forward initiative. We've gone back and forth, and Pastor Greg, I know even you, you've talked about this. You and Ida Lynn have been praying over this. You've been having conversations. How can we steward our resources for kingdom impact? And God has constantly reminded me that we have tested God over and over and over again when we respond with a tithe and offering and we are always blown away by how God takes care of us. How God is always the great provider. We've never been left wanting. We've never been left wanting. Do you trust God to supply all of your needs? Have you tested him in this? And how are you stewarding what he has entrusted you for kingdom impact? We are boldly praying 
for 100% participation in our forward initiative. At every level of giving. And we know that it is absolutely between you and God and what we want more than anything is for God to take you on this journey, for God to take you on this journey of transformation where you can test God and trust that all that God has given you is for kingdom impact. And so how can we respond in generosity? And how can we entrust God? It's all grace. It's all gift. And I've learned along the way that it is grace when we get to be part of something so much bigger than ourselves. And so this is why we've done bold things, like put pieces of paper in your hand, like a commitment card, where you see on there different levels of commitment. We've given that to you early because we want you to pray about it. We want you to go on this journey with God and ask, how can I use my resources for kingdom impact? And so we pray that you don't, you don't take those commitment hard cards home and, and throw them away or lose them, but make it a matter of prayer. Make it a matter of prayer and reflect and test God and see that you will, be nev- you will never be left wanting and test God, and see what God can do through your generosity. Let's take a look at this story right here. I'm Kyle Hickel, and this is my wife, Jean. We've been a part of Good Shepherd for nine years as members, and before that, we started coming together when we were dating. So it's been a long journey here, and it's been a great experience. When I first came, what I really loved about Good Shepherd was the community, the the preaching, the pastors, the services. We loved that this church had both the traditional and contemporary and drawn to both. And it was just incredible. And just the, the welcoming feeling that we had coming here and having a place like this to worship. One, when we first came in the doors, it was, uh, it was very welcoming. And, you know, it, it made you want to come back, you know, even after the, the first day. One spiritual defining moment that we've had at Good Shepherd is our daughter. So we struggled for years um, with dreams of, you know, having children and um, going through the uh, infertility route. Being open about my prayers and my desires, I came to know of this beautiful little girl who would, we would then uh, end up adopting. And that was one and a half years ago, and it was the most incredible moment in our lives. And it's just amazing how God, you know, brought us through this journey. We never would have thought it would have happened via our church. And, but what a beautiful way that we got to know and connect uh, with this family that gave us the greatest gift of our lives. The real special thing is when we baptize Katharina here at Good Shepherd. And I realized, wow, during the service and during the baptism, I thought back to all these moments with uh, her small group and how we got connected, even all the way to the, the rooted groups and all the men's groups that I was in and the small groups we were in. I realized there was a bunch of little pieces that, that you didn't realize at the time uh, when we were going through all these little things, little groups, and the Christian community in general here. It was kind of a lead in to what was gonna happen on that day when we, when we baptized her in the church, so it was a, it was a great moment. I choose to give the Good Shepherd because it's part of a, a foundation that we have in our marriage. No matter where we're at, whether it's good times, bad times, financially or health or anything like that, by giving to Good Shepherd, it always feels like you're, you're doing the right thing to move forward in the name of Jesus Christ. Living a generous life, it can be scary at times, and I really believe it's about trusting in the Lord and praying that the Lord will use whatever you're able to give in amazing ways. Your giving and generosity is going to make a difference. Put your trust in the Lord, you know, wholeheartedly, um, and, and you'll be surprised at what He can do.